everybody. Um, we're glad to have you here. Um, we're also glad to have Ted back with us. This is his third uh, Lunch and Learn with us. Um, Ted, if you don't know, is a local video producer and he also, he's also won uh, 13 Emmy Awards. Um, and we're glad to have him back. He's going to talk with us today about the Canon XF105. KPN TV has three of these cameras and as you will find out there they have a lot of different features and they're um, one of our go-to cameras when we go out in the field. So we're excited to learn about those and have Ted back with us. Thank you very much Becky. Okay so if you have not used this camera before um, too bad because it's a really amazing camera. I mean, one of the things that's, that I was really impressed about it, by it, is that on automatic you get some really good pictures. In fact, it's unbelievable how many different lighting situations, audio situations, the thing you just throw it all on automatic and you'll always come back with something. I mean, you'll always get a shot and a lot of times you'll get a pretty damn good shot, you know. But what I wanted to get into with this workshop today is because a couple of people have talked to me, hey, if I'm in this kind of situation, I don't want to use the thing with like the automatic exposure, or I don't want to use the automatic audio recording level or something like that, what do we do? You know, what, how much can you do? <clears throat> and this camera has most of the features that a real full-size broadcast video camera would have. Most of it is inside the menu. The real difference between this and a big broadcast camera is the image size, and we can get into that in a different workshop, the, the sensor size, but also the fact that it's got all these different cool controls. The broadcast camera has individual buttons for those usually. You know, all the different settings that you can have on this are on dedicated switches, which increases the cost and the size of the camera and all that other stuff. So if you want a nice lightweight little camera that will come back with some really good results. This is a great camera. So I encourage everybody to, you know, take one of these things out, just use it, um, try it under different situations and just get used to what the thing can do. So, and you'll have a pretty good appreciation of what it can do on automatic. But what we're going to get into today is um, what you can do if you take the thing off of automatic and actually start playing around with the settings. Then you're, it's like a computer though. You can't break it really, unless you drop the thing. You know, you're not gonna, if you just play around with the settings and something, you know, looks really strange or something like that, you can always take it back to what the original setting was and you haven't ruined anything or broken anything. So the idea is not to be timid with trying this stuff out because that's the only way you're gonna learn. The manuals for this thing are available online. In fact, if you go <clears throat> just do a Google search, uh, Canon FX 105 manual and you'll find that there are a number of websites that have PDF documents that are every single page of the man operating manual on this. There's a really good index at the front and it'll pretty much guide you to whatever it is you need to know about it. So sitting down with the camera and the operating manual is probably one of the best ways to acquaint yourself with this. What we're going to do today in about 35 minutes is try to run through some of the more basic stuff that you would probably be interested in. Now the reason you would want to, you know, not just let it go on automatic is if you want to have the control over basically everything. You know, you want to be able to control how intense the audio is being recorded. You want to be able to deal with different lighting situations. A lot of times, you know, you take this stuff out, you don't have a lighting kit with you, you run into a really strange situation and you got to be able to think for the camera sometimes. Sometimes, you know, automatic is fine, sometimes it's not. So we're going to get into that today. One of the first things I wanted to talk about is audio because it's one of the simplest things to be able to control. And that's not something that you see up there. This, this is the microphone that's built into the camera. So um, you got a left channel and a right channel. You get pretty good stereo reception. If you want to be able to, you know, sort of get whatever's going on, there's t switches on the top that say A and M. A is for automatic, M is for manual. Manual is controlled with, they're like little volume controls on the top of the camera. And you can see in the viewfinder, this is your VU meter for channel one and channel two. One is on the right, two is on the left. 
And you can see on automatic, it stays pretty good. As soon as you put it over on manual, you have it in its, in its set way the hell down. You have to turn this up. You see, if you go up, it'll start pinning. And then as you bring the thing down, it goes into a more reasonable level. The big advantage to controlling your audio manually is that the automatic level control that's built into the audio circuits, what it'll do is it'll look for a sound. You know, if, it, if, it's, if nobody's talking, what it'll do is it'll just bring up the volume so you can start hearing, you know, the air conditioning, people coughing in the background or stuff like that. And then when someone starts talking, it grabs down the audio level so that, you know, there's a real change in terms of what the presence of your audio track is. So if you have the time to actually set your levels manually, you'll end up with a much cleaner audio track because then you won't get all that background noise coming, unless you want it, you know. And if you're in a situation where someone's talking at the front of a room and then somebody in back has a question, it won't be the greatest audio in the world if you're not using a remote microphone, but you will get something. But if you don't want to get that sort of noise that happens when there's a crowd just sort of sneezing, shuffling, and stuff like that. You want to be able to set it on manual. So that's just a simple switch up on the top here, and you can see what your actual level is in the viewfinder. So if you're like shooting out in the middle of a field, right. then you would want it on the, on the automatic, because then you're going to get... If someone's, if someone's not talking, right? right. You're you you're going to get all the background um, right. Unless there's like, you know, a, then, but suddenly a bird goes or something like that, it'll grab down all the audio. So you'll lose that, that background sound then. All of a sudden the track will go dead right after the bird goes squawk if it's like, you know, up in a tree next to you or something like that. It'll just grab down the audio because now it heard something loud, right? So if you want to just get, you know, if you're just out like, you know, shooting something outdoors and you just want to get a nice clean background track, do it, do it on manual. Because, and the thing is, if the other thing about audio that always astounds me is how many people I see shooting with a video cam without headphones. How the hell do you know what you're getting audio wise if you're not listening to what is on the track? You know, that, that's something that I think, you know, you should try to do more. Yes? I was trying to watch, is, is there a visual indicator on the uh, monitor uh, uh, for the uh, auto manual? No, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you whether you are or not, you know. You just have to look at the switch to see, if, is it on A or is it on M, you know. You can also switch to, um, the internal mic is, you know, this one here. If you want to plug in a mic, because there are jacks on the other side here. And this is if you have like, you know, a shotgun mic or like I'm wearing today is a wireless microphone. It plugs into, at the camera end, there's a receiver, and that plugs into here as well. So if you want to be able to use a bunch of different microphones, this is where you plug in. You switch it over to external microphone here, and then you can start either setting levels or use it on automatic, depending on, you know, what your situation is. XLRs? Yes, yeah. Three-pin XLRs on here. So... So audio is pretty simple. I mean, you've, you've only got, you know, a few options, and so it's easy to deal with. The other, th I mean, when you get, start getting into video, this is where the options go crazy. So the idea is, I think, don't try to memorize the manual. Use the camera in a bunch of different situations and sort of remember what you did, and then look at the footage afterwards and get an idea of, did that work? Is that the best way to do this? You know, it just takes some experimenting on your own, but... Once you've started using it a little, you'll get really good really fast at knowing what setting to change, what setting to sort of leave the same. So I think one of the things we'll go through first is, say you wanted to control ex the exposure. You're in a situation where you know, you've got fairly good control over the lighting, but maybe you're not in the optimum situation. Let me demonstrate what an optimum situation is. As you can see back here, we're sort of in the gloom this camera is practically all, that studio camera is practically all in darkness, but we still have an image, you know. The camera can still see into these things. It's all grainy, you know, there's, there's not a lot of, there's, some of the detail is sacrificed. But even without lighting, you know, you got an image, which means, you know, if you're, if it's between getting a great image or no image, 
you know, you want to get something. So throw it on automatic and do that. But here's a typical situation. Say you've got, this is a window, okay? You're on automatic. You go over here and your subject is standing here in the dark, right? You can't have both going on at once. Now, either move the subject away from the window, which sometimes is impossible. Bring in a light, you know, so you got more light coming on the, the person who's in the darkness. Or adjust the camera. Now, one of the things that happens a lot is if you're trying to, you know, again, on automatic, what it does is it looks at the scene, the automatic circuitry looks at the scene and tries to figure out what's the brightest, what's the darkest, and sort of give you an average. Right now, it's looking at this wicked bright, you know, window. Also, sometimes if you're shooting outdoors, like say you're at the uh, Cape Ann Farmer's Market, somebody's under a tent. They're kind of dark. The background is really bright. The automatic setting on the camera is going to see the bright background and do the same kind of thing, where you'll have, you know, the bright background out here, and then whoever's inside the tent is going to be in the gloom. So best way to deal with that is start using this thing manually. Now, there is a switch down here. Underneath where you put the memory cards, there's a switch down here that says full automatic, M, which is manual, and then there's a little padlock there, which means if you want to lock in all the settings you're doing, so no matter what happens, bump the camera, push this or something like that, it won't change it. So lock is a good setting if you're running around with something you don't want stuff to get changed. When you go to manual, as we go over here, you'll see there are three settings that you can control manually here. There's actually four that we'll talk about today. Color temperature. We're in a studio here. We've got more or less tungsten lighting. so. It's still in automatic, but it says, okay, this is about what the color temperature is. If you want to find out more about color temperature, there's great tutorials on the website that really explain, you know, what kind of light source has what sort of color temperature and how to deal with that. But basically figure the lower the number, the redder the light is. So it's like a tungsten light, something like that, something like this, you know, is sort of on the reddish orangey side of it. Daylight, if we go over here, daylight is bluer, you know, so if it st starts going like that, you'll start seeing the uh, color temperature going up, which is not doing it that much here. <laughs> So the bluer the light, the higher the color temperature. So there are, way, there are sometimes ways you, you know, can deal with that. There are other ways, the other times, you know, you don't really have any control over the fact that you've got a window light and then you've got, you know, maybe a tungsten light that's like balancing like that. So you need to be able to have some kind of control over it. You can control all of these things. The f-stop, which is really the main, the main exposure control that you've got on a video camera, um, can also be adjusted. And what we're going to do is try that out. So, okay, I need a volunteer to stand near the window. Roger. All right, so you're in the window like that, but stand next to it in the dark part. All right, so there he is. You want to be able to see what the hell he's doing. So, there are three buttons in the front of the camera here, I don't know if you can see them, but iris, gain, shutter. These are all ways to be able to control the exposure. We're just going to deal with what the iris control does. Press on the iris control <coughs> if you're in manual. So the two things you can do to be able to control the iris. Here's the automatic setting. And there's the manual setting. Go 
here. So basically, the automatic setting says it wants, wants to be an F4. You widen out, and an F4 leaves Roger in the dark there. Press the iris button so it goes, it goes, you see the A disappear. And now it says F4.0. So the knob, there's like this little knob underneath the lens. And you can see what happens. Turn it one way, the picture gets darker. Turn it the other way, it gets brighter. So now you can shoot your subject next to a window or with a bright background, and you can see who it is or what it is. Thank you. <laughs> is that white? Is that zebra in there? That, well, that, that's, a, that's a whole other basket of information, which we'll get into right now. Now, the viewfind, this is the, out, this is the direct output from this camera with a lot of the information that you'll find in the viewfinder. But there's other information that doesn't go into the monitor that you can only see in the viewfinder. I don't know if you can catch it, but if you see in the middle of the white card, there are a bunch of like very fine horizontal stripes. Those are called zebra stripes. And what you can do is see if you're shooting something that's brighter than what standard video brightness should be. And that's where you get the, the zebra stripes. If you, the more you open up the iris, the brighter it is and the more zebras you see. The more you darken it, I don't know if you can see this thing shrinking, but eventually that goes away. And this, there are various, you can set, you can set what your zebra display is showing you. It's either showing, you know, 100% brightness, it's showing you 75% brightness. There are places in the menu that you can go to actually set that. So that's one, that's a button that's right out here. And right now I'm just sticking with what the buttons are on the camera. So, you know, not even going to the menu yet. So you can turn on zebras, turn them off. In our situation here, we're not going to look at that. But you can see this is a way to be able to take care of this without having to bring in an extra light, without having to, you know, move the subject or, you know, sometimes you just can't. Sometimes, you know, you're outdoors and it's dark in the shadows and it's really bright outside. Uh, a question on the striping. Uh, <clears throat> is the image on the, the onboard monitor an accurate representation of what's going on to your recording? Fairly, it, yeah. As opposed to a, a lower resolution uh, cutoff staircase kind of effect. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, <coughs> play with it is what my advice would be, is, 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 is check it out. You know, the other, the, thing, the other way to be able to really accurately see how bright your image is, there's a little button down here called WFM, and what that means is waveform monitor. And you can't see that, again, this is not something you can see in this particular, in the output from the camera. But in the viewfinder, there's this little screen in the bottom here that's got like green, it almost looks like a graph. And what it is, is it really shows you how bright your image is and how dark your stuff is. So as, you know, as we brighten things up, the graph tends to grow. And then as you darken it down, the graph goes down. You can start seeing, you know, some of the other stuff in there. And what, what that really is, is it gives you an idea of what's the brightest part of your picture, what's the darkest part of your picture, and can you get it all into your exposure that you're dealing with. So that's, that's another thing to play around with, is just sort of see what the correlation is between what the waveform monitor shows you and how bright your picture is or how dark it is, how much you can see in the shadows, how much you can see in the highlights. This is a pretty good camera in terms of that. I mean, the early video cameras were pretty bad in terms of what the contrast ranges you could get. You could, a film camera can basically capture about 16 stops. You know, if you figure like from 2.8 to F64, you know, a, film a lot of film will be able to just get some kind of detail in that whole range. Video is different. But digital video is a pretty good compromise because you can get a lot of information in the highlights, a lot of information in the dark stuff, which means when you go to editing, you can tweak this stuff a little. You can um, 
make the dark stuff a little bit brighter. You can play around with the contrast. The idea of being able to control the camera is so you can get the maximum quality into your original image. So you get as much detail into the shot as possible. And then you can start playing around with color temperature, exposure, how bright it is, how contrasty it is when you're in post. So the idea here is to be able to do this in the camera as much as possible. The other thing, okay, let's deal with focus. So. Now, it's on automatic focus, so you can see I can, I can focus on the wall over here, see, and then pan over to the laptop, and eventually it'll figure out how far away it is. But say you're in the middle of a shot. I mean, this is good if you're shooting sports or if you're shooting something that you just don't have the time to manually adjust the focus on. But sometimes there are times when you want to have something in focus and the rest of it out of focus, no matter what else is happening. So, back down here. On this side of the camera, there's a button here that says AFMF, that's automatic focus, manual focus. So, and it changes here, see? So you got, you'll know you're on automatic focus when it's image, automatic focus. You press the button, and it goes to manual focus. So, the other thing that's a good trick is there's, on most cameras, you know, this ring is for adjusting the focus. You can also, on this camera, you can switch it over so it controls the f-stop. You can't do both. You know, you, don't, you wouldn't want to do both. You want to be focusing and then changing your f-stop at the same time. So what you can do is set it up for focus and set it up for, for iris. Or zoom. You know, you can manually zoom this thing. So basically there are three ways, there are three different settings on the lens. On the, on the same ring. This ring can control the uh, iris, it can control the zoom, and it can control the focus. Today, we're going to go over to focus. So, and you know, the more you zoom in, the shallower your depth of field becomes. That, may, that means the less stuff is in focus. As we zoom out here, you can see that sort of the wall and the laptop are kind of all in focus. But as you, your lens gets longer and longer and longer, you have to pick something to focus on. In this situation, because we're on manual focus, I can focus on the laptop, pan over here, the wall is still out of focus, but the laptop stays in focus. So you don't have the thing searching for what's in focus in the middle of your shot. You know, if you're going to edit from the wall to the laptop, then you don't have to worry about it. But if you want to be able to really select what's in focus, manual is the way to go. And that's a really, again, that's really simple, just using this button here on the lens. The other thing you might want to do is, I mean, you've seen this effect before. Something starts off in the background. You know, you want to be able to pull focus. So there's the background, and you want to be able to show the laptop. You know, it's a, sometimes it's an effect that's overused. But like, say you're out on a dock, and you got like, you know, a lobster trap here. And then there's a fishing boat in the background. You want to be able to show the lobster trap, then show the fishing boat. And instead of zooming or something like that, if you just rack focus between, you know, the lobster trap and then the fishing boat, you can get, you know, kind of a cool effect with that. And when you're thinking about shots, when you're doing stuff, you're telling a story. You know, so you want to be able to say, how am I leading the viewer from one topic to another? How am I kind of getting people to follow what it is I'm thinking about or trying to show. And being able to use selective focus on stuff is really an effective tool. So knowing how to be able to manually focus this camera is really helpful. The other thing you may have noticed is, you know, when you're doing this, sometimes the image is swimming around, but the camera's not moving. 
That's because you've got the image stabilizer on. That's what this little hand is. And what that means is if you're running with the camera, it'll try to steady the picture as much as possible. But if you've got it on a tripod, you don't really need that feature. As a matter of fact, it gets in your way because, you know, say you're trying to go over to something and see how it's like sort of searching for what's, what's the steady part of the picture here. And so when you're on a tripod and you're moving the camera like this, a lot of times you don't want that automatic steadying effect. So you basically go to back to this again. You know, it's in one of these things back here. And there's a button called Powered IS. You know, you'd think you would just have like another picture of the, you know, the hand. But no, no, it's Powered IS. And what that means is it's the image stabilization circuit. So you just click that. And it goes away, more or less. Now, what another way to be able to check that is by going into the menu here. This is where things get really interesting. Because you've got settings for the camera, sound, video setup, which is more or less you know, what your output is, what you see in the viewfinder, time code. And Other. Other has some cool stuff in it. We'll see how much we can get into it with that. But, so you go back up to the camera setup. And this is all pretty much two buttons. There's the one button that says Menu. That's how you get into the menu settings. And then there's this sort of little joystick thing here that does all this stuff. So we're looking for OIS, which is Optical Image Stabilization. You click on that, you can hit Off, then you hit Menu again. In that menu, did it show that you could control the shutter speed? Yes. Okay, so you see, that's how you make the hand go away, is you go into the menu and you turn off the image stabilization. That means you can come back to it by hitting this button. A lot of times there are more than one way to be able to control the camera. I like to set up the camera as much as possible so that these buttons are active, so you don't have to think about where in the menu is that particular setting. You know, so you're not searching around for it all the time. As much as you can make... In fact, there are six buttons here which you can program to have different controls that you would ordinarily have to hunt around in the menu for. So you can set that stuff up. And all these settings you can record on a little SD card that plugs into here. And again, this is something that you should really practice with. Look through the manual and check it all out because we don't really have time to get into all of it here. Yeah? Did you imply that those four in the back or some number of those are programmable? Or is it these six, yeah, these six buttons. six, but the four at the end. No, these aren't, except that, you know, you can control when it says uh, image stabilization, you can go into the menu and select which kind of image stabilization oh, okay. you want. So was, yeah, so that, that was why I went into the menu for that. On, yeah, this is, ba this is on, off. And in the other control, it tells you what kind of image yes. stabilization you have. Yes, exactly. On. Yeah. So if you turn it off, then you see you can pan the camera and it doesn't swim around at the end of the when you stop moving the camera so a lot of times you do want to have that image stabilization because you're not on a tripod but if you are there you go all right so we did exposure focus white balance now why would you want to change the white balance on something well because say you're shooting outdoors it's daylight that's one setting Say you want to be able to shoot a sunset, you know, how much if you're, what the camera will do is it'll automatically set the white balance for what it thinks should be right. So what it'll do is it'll take all the red out of a sunset. You don't want to do that. So what you do is, again, there's an outside button here called WB. And what WB does is you got presets. The little bulb is tungsten. Or you can set your white balance 
pretty much the way you do with a broadcast camera. And the way you do that is here's, here's your light source, here's a white card, and you can just bring like any little white card with you. Shoot a picture of, you know, focus on the white card. And where you see this image here, it's like two little wedges with a box on top of it. And you'll see there's a button on the outside of the camera that has that same icon. If you press that, it'll figure out what the color temperature is. And you've got two settings. You've got an A setting and you've got a B setting. And a lot of times if you're going from indoors to outdoors and then back out again, you want to be able to change your white balance manually instead of having the thing automatically figure out what the white balance is. By hitting this button, white balance here, you've got two different settings. So you can, you can have, you know, a tungsten setting. Let me just not, let me get, get a little bit into that. Here's the, auto, you know, automatically it says this is what it should be. There are presets. There's tungsten, there's daylight, and I think there's a fluorescent setting as well. And that's in the menu. But if you know that what you want to have as a, pre, at a, as a preset is if you're shooting in the studio, you're using tungsten light most of the time, that's where you should go back to. So you have a choice. You have a preset, one, you know, one setting that you can set manually yourself, another one that you can set manually yourself in automatic. So if you want to be able to control, like say you've got, you know, You've got some lighting inside. It's a combination of a little bit of daylight coming in through a window. You've got like a table light, which is giving off a little bit of tungsten light as well. And you've got maybe another tungsten light off on the side that's providing a lot of the basic lighting for the scene. Set, the, you know, set it for what color looks good to you. And hopefully it's like, you know, sort of something in the middle between all these different colors of the really warm tungsten light and the really cool daylight. And then you can play around, you can make some final decisions about how cool or warm you want it to look when you're in editing. But at least here you have some information in the, in the warm areas and some information in the daylight areas. So you'll always have that stuff to be able to work with. Again, it's, you know, practice with this thing. Go out, take it, go into like dark situations, bright situations, outdoors, indoors. Just try this stuff out and see what you get. You know, if you, re if one of the things that I did when I, would get a new camera to use on a job or something like that. I would, you know, rent it like a day ahead of time and go out and try stuff out, make notes about what time code I shot this test, what time code I shot that test, then come back and look at it on a, on a decent monitor. Because, you know, face it, sometimes when you're outdoors and you're looking at this little screen here, it's not the best reference. It's better than nothing but it's going to get washed out in the daylight. It might be too bright when you're indoors. So you really don't get an idea of you know, what, your, what your results are. So what I would suggest doing is anytime you got a, working with a camera that you're not familiar with, shoot some test footage and really get an idea of what the results are when you end up with what you end up with. When you're trying to capture Ben, for example, in the sunset, as you mentioned, yeah. which way do you go more towards in the white balance? It, it comes down to your aesthetic decision about, do I want this to look more like there's daylight or do I want this to look more like there's, you know, artificial light working here? And sometimes you want to be able to show both. You know, sometimes somebody is like at a desk and they're working, they got a little desk light and then there's something over here that the window is lighting. So the thing that the window is lighting is blue. The stuff at the desk is kind of orangey. You know, pick it or shoot it twice if you possibly can. You know, sometimes that's the best way to do it is just, you know, and then make your decision in editing. After all, it's only bits and bytes. You know, it's not like back when I started, we shot on film. And once you've shot on film, that's it. You can't use it again. You know, you shoot it, it gets processed, you're, that's your picture. That's it. Okay. Whereas with this stuff, you know, you can put a 64 gigabyte card in here and shoot all day. So why not shoot as many backup things as, you, as time allows? Mm -hmm. And that way you'll always end up with a better image than if you just said, well, that's enough. So. Let me see what else. What else? Before I get into anything deeper, any other questions?
Anyone wants to ask about what we talked about? I'm just watching on your monitor there that channel one on your audio right. seems to be dead or off. That's because it's on external. In other words, I had this switched over so I could plug a microphone okay, so into I'm channel, channel one. one left and right. No. Okay, no. thank you. So we have automatic, automatic. And now they're both, you know, because it's the same microphone right here. I mean, you can, you know, tap that side. Stereo? This is a stereo microphone. And it's pretty good. I mean, it does do a good job in terms of separating out what's on the right and what's on the left. So, again, it's the kind of thing, you know, put the headphones on, record some stuff, see how loud you can get away with something, see how quiet something can be and still pick up. And Eight inch uh, jack? Or? Yeah. Re regular eighth inch jack for the uh, headphone input. Head I, first time I had this camera, I was looking all over the place. Where's the headphone jack? And it's under the battery here. It's right next to where the power supply comes in. It's a compact camera, so you know, sometimes like everything is like all jammed together. But that's where the headphone jack is. is and then, oh, go ahead. Is there any way to diminish wind on this? Not on this. I, mean, I think you know you could try, you know, taking taking a piece of foam rubber tape it across the front, and that'll cut some of the wind that you're, you're going to end up with. Because it's pretty much an unprotected microphone, you're going to get wind noise, if there is any. So again, that's another reason to use an external microphone. You've got to get a shotgun mic with a windscreen on it, and then you won't have that problem. So Steinhauser? Steinhauser. Sen you would just clamp it onto the shoe and go? Yeah, exactly. If you want to use a, like a wireless mic, like what I'm wearing here, the 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 receiver just you know goes into the hot shoe. Well, it's a cold shoe actually on the top of the camera, so you're not dragging extra pieces around with wires hanging off and stuff like that. It can be a very compact you know portable unit. There are other things. I have one more question. Go. Um, what is what size is the image sensor on this? This is I believe this is a one third. Becky, do you know? It's either a quarter inch or a one third inch. It's a, um, uh, it's like a nine, eight or nine megabyte sensor. You know, so it's really not made for doing still photography, but because you know you're playing this back at 30 frames a second, a lot of the grain and resolution changes and stuff like that you don't notice. You know, in moving video, you don't need the the sensor size that you would need for a still photo, and you know, like a a Canon 5D has like a 24 megabyte sensor, so it's obviously getting a lot more information, which is why doing freeze frames and blowing them up to get a still is usually not recommended you know, with something like this. One other trick I want to show you before we uh, get out of here is, okay, we've done that. It is one third? Good. So that's better than a quarter. Yeah, because yeah, Panasonic's have a quarter inch sensor. This is better. So what do we got down here? Canon Vixia HFS21, and it, oh, yeah? it actually has a, a half inch size for me sensor. Mm. OK. In the, the bottom of the menu, called Other Functions, which has got this little wrench thing there, this is the area you, this is where you go to to um, set a lot of the more picky things. And it's also where you go to to format your card. They hide it so you don't inadvertently do that. See, Initialize Media, that's where you, if you've got a card, you know, say you've got your own cards, you don't use the cards that Cape Ann TV has because you want to be able to hang on to the card. You don't want to have to give it back. So you take your own CF card and you format it here with initialized media. And it asks you what kind of card you got in there. Right now we have no cards. You can see the uh, these things here show you if you've got a card in here and which card you're recording off of because you can put two cards in here. You can put, put two 64 gigabyte cards in here. And that gives you like up to six hours of, of recording time, which 
I don't know what you're doing that you need six hours without having to move the cards, but there it is for you. At any rate, that's that. Up here. I'm frame per second with this camera. This can do up to 40. I'll, I'll, that's what I'm, okay. I'll get into that real quick. Um, interval record, also known as time lapse. What you can do is you go into interval record. This will record whatever you set it like. Say you want one frame every second, which means something that's um, 60 seconds long will only last six seconds. So you can, you, know, you can do the math and sort of figure it out. So your interval, the interval says how often you're taking a picture. We're going to say one. And then record how many frames. Smoothest time lapse is usually one frame at a time. And, but if you want, sometimes you want to record two frames at a time for a certain look. Again, it's the kind of thing that you experiment with to see what works best for you. The other thing is frame record. And this is if you want to do like a claymation thing. You want to be able to shoot one frame at a time and then play it back all the, all the, all the frames together. So what this will do is record just, if you're in frame record mode, you can record just one frame at a time and do, you know, a Gumby movie. So that's... And what, you just hit a button every time? Yeah. So it's on one. Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you go back? Yes. On record frames? Yeah. And you can increase the number just so that you... Yeah, can so when you, when you hit the button, you... you, you well, if you, if you hit it once, this will just take one frame. If you got set on three, it'll take three frames when you hit the button. Right, but then if you do something like that, you can post and, and really up your resolution. And get not, scintillation removal. not really. I mean, what, the, what this will do is you'll, you can see the difference if you're recording one, if you're recording three frames every time you hit the button. It'll be like a bunch of steppy moves, whereas if you're doing it, it'll be more fluid. But again, it's the kind of thing you got to sort of figure out. How long, is, how long do I want the, the ball of clay to roll across okay, the table? So it's not averaging those number, that number of frames into a, a final frame? No, it's not. Okay. No, it's actually shooting three frames or six frames or whatever you know, you're, you're dealing with here. Slow and fast motion. This is the last thing we're going to get into here. What's, what you need to be able to do with this Bitrate resolution. This is where you pick out what you're going to be. There are all different kinds of flavors of high definition television. 1920 by 1080 is sort of maximum resolution high def. 50 megabytes per second is one of the is the highest recording rate you can for you can have for the data on this camera. But you see, you can also do it at uh, 1280 by 720 in various other lower, lower resolutions as well. If you want to shoot slow motion, it won't do it on 1080, but it will do it on 720. So you have to get into this menu at the bit rate resolution. Bing. So now it's 720. If you see, you know, it's, it's like a slight, it's blown up the picture just a little bit. That's because you're blowing up a 720 image to a 1080 image. Then, slow and fast motion. Here are all the different frame rates you can do. You can do up to 60 frames per second, or take it all the way down to 12 frames per second. If you shoot something at 12 frames per second, play it back at 30 frames per second, it'll be like double speed. Shoot something at 60 frames per second, play it back at 30, and you've got like half speed slow motion. 
and you can do it right in the camera. This is not something because like if you take like something you record ordinarily and then put it into an edit machine and then slow it down, you'll still get like kind of a steppy slow motion effect. You'll get slow motion, but it won't be as smooth as if you shot it with the 60 frames per second frame rate. So, and we're just about out of time. So hopefully I gave you enough to um, think about here that you go out, get one of these, you know, with your membership, get, you know, take the camera out, shoot around for a day, look at the manual that's online, try out all the different stuff and see what you can do with this camera. I mean, we just scratched the surface today in terms of some of the effects, the different settings and other stuff like that. So work it, play around with it, talk to some of the folks here about, you know, what do I do to make this happen? But hopefully this talk today will have given you some ideas about some of the creative possibilities you can now pursue with a really cool little camera like this. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.